For how good dungeons are in the Legend of Zelda series, they'd be in vain if it weren't for the brilliant items you use along the way. It's all fine and good having a sweet dungeon to play through, but if all you had was a sword then you're not going to get the fullest enjoyment out of it. With later Zelda games, the series branched out to more unique and let's be honest, weirder items in order to heavily impact the gameplay. You would have never expected something like the Dominion Rod in an earlier Zelda game. So yeah, let's look at what I consider to be the best of them. I'm not really looking at history or folklore, so the Master Sword doesn't automatically get 10,000 points because it's the most famous item in the series. I'm actually veering towards how the Zelda series treats each respective item and how fun they are to use. Because let's be honest here, the Master Sword is literally just a fancy looking sword. Anyway, let's get going. If there was one item in the Zelda series that I feel deserves a bit more coverage and love, it's got to be the Magnetic Gloves. They've only ever appeared in two games, Oracle of Seasons and Four Swords, and even Four Swords seem to put it in as like an afterthought. Like, let's just throw this item in there and see what happens. So really we're only looking at Oracle of Seasons, and luckily this game made using the Magnetic Gloves incredibly enjoyable. As the name implies, the Magnetic Gloves allows you to push or pull magnetic objects like giant balls or by pulling yourself across giant chasms. Hey, it even found a use in combat against the very memorable enemies called Maganusu, Magan, Mag, Magun Enusu, where you repel or attract them to either keep them away from you or pull them in for a sword attack. And then we have a boss fight at the end with Dig Dogger. Previous fights with Dig Dogger were ridiculously underwhelming, but in Oracle of Seasons, you use your fancy gloves and drag around the biggest spike ball in the entire world, doing damage that way. Now granted, some aspects like flying across pits have been better dealt with, with items like the hook shot, but I would love it if Nintendo brought this thing back, even for just one 3D game. Yeah, the hook shot can do most of the same things, but the magnetic gloves use magnets. And magnets are like friggin' witchcraft or something, I don't know. You know shields? Yeah, I love those little guys. For all the incredible swords you get in the Zelda series, you don't really get any mind-blowing shields to speak of. It's like swords are that one guy who always gets the new iPhone, even though it's exactly the same as the last one, and the shields are the guy who doesn't really care either way. He's gonna stick with that crappy Samsung he had when he was 12. Come to think of it, the only Zelda game that gave shields any limelight was Skyward Sword, but I'm not gonna pick any of them because they had durability meters, and that was just lame, guys. So instead, I'm going to talk about one of the only shields to be interesting in any way, shape or form. Yep, that's right, we're talking about the motherfucking mirror shield. Conventional or boring shields just block attacks. Mirror shields look in the eyes of your enemy's attacks and laugh. They laugh at the thought of the attack causing damage. And should it be some sort of magic projectile sun, it's getting returned to sender with a massive troll face on it. So sure, they reflect some attacks, but what else you got? Well, if a Zelda game has a mirror shield in it, it's usually the last shield you get, and they are very well designed. From the glistening mirror shield in Ocarina of Time, to the heroic looking Wind Waker version, to whatever the hell this is in Majora's Mask, it is never something boring to look at. You've come this far, you might as well have something interesting on your back for a change. The majority of all items used in the Zelda series fit the setting very well. In an adventure game, you naturally have some items that are staples within the genre and suit the ideals of adventuring through a gaming world. On that note, I should point out that the spinner from Twilight Princess is absolutely none of these. The phrase, what the fuck is this shit, comes to mind when you see the spinner. Maybe if you were Sherlock Holmes or some other guy with a pipe, you might have worked out from the grooves strewn around the Arbiter's grounds that you would do a Beyblade as an item. And let's be honest, it looks a teensy bit out of place, doesn't it? Big, flowing, luscious grassland. But Beyblades, motherfucker! Surprisingly, it does have a use, and it's how you use it that it gets a spot on this list. It doesn't get a ton of use outside of where you find it, but as long as you're in the Arbiter's grounds, you're gonna have a hell of a time. You use it like a skateboard, so you can attach yourself to railings and zip about, providing some helpful transportation through rooms and across sand. It's not entirely necessary, as there are a ton of items in the series that could have done a similar job, but the fun factor with this thing are just through the roof. And hell, it's put to good fun in the Stalod boss fight.
For most situations, a sword simply isn't good enough. Sure, you can get in there and do some damage while swinging around like a deranged lunatic, but what about more elaborate puzzles? Well, you need more of a finer touch. There's been a ton of Switch puzzles in Zelda games that require you to activate something from range. And unless you're an idiot and think that throwing your sword is the way forward, it's likely that you've only got one option. It's the boomerang, of course. The boomerang is that understated weapon in the series. It doesn't destroy weapons like nobody's business or make things explode or dance around like gear him on hot coals, but it does its job very well and with a great deal of enjoyment in the process. It's used as a kind of combo weapon, showing up in the first Zelda game and staying relatively ever-present since. Like I said, you don't waltz around chucking it about expecting to kill people with it, but you instead focus on stunning enemies of it and then finishing them off with something else. It also proves to be a very versatile item for puzzle solving. Most games have it as a long-ranged weapon that can hit switches, but games like Wind Waker and Twilight Princess gave the formula a much-needed kick at the backside. In both of these games, you can lock on to more than one target at a time, so not only does it open up the door for some truly awesome puzzles, but some tactical fighting too. By moving it to the DS and to Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, somebody in Nintendo looked at the DS's touchscreen and thought that a boomerang would be unbelievably perfect for touchscreen controls. And you know what, they were, they were pretty right about that, and rather inevitably, you could draw a path for the boomerang to fly through on the touchscreen. Holy mother of balls. But one last thing, the only games that haven't featured the boomerang as a usable item are the Adventure of Link and, strangely, Skyward Sword. Surely the boomerang would have been perfect for one-to-one -one Wii motion controls or whatever Skyward Sword had. Maybe it's just me, but they missed out on a great trick there. One of my favourite aspects about Zelda items and weapons is how they reinvent themselves and set them apart from similar weapons in other franchises. For example, there are a ton and a half of games out there that have bombs as a weapon, in some form or another. The Zelda series, however, has not only made bombs a very important and almost default weapon in the franchise, but they've mixed up the formula in some games and made them more interesting to use. The games that come to mind are Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword. Bombs are an extremely basic item, which might be why loads of other games have them. You lob at a wall, and hey presto, that wall magically breaks apart and you can continue on. In every Zelda game with the exception of Adventure of Link again, where they didn't even show up, this has been the basic use of bombs for a really long time, like 26 years or something. However, Ocarina of Time brought in the bomb chews, bombs that have a long fuse and track along walls and ceilings so you can blow up harder to reach areas. And they look like a freaking mouse, and that's worth like 20 points in this thing. Twilight Princess then went all out and brought in a couple of really cool additions. We got the bomb arrows, literally arrows with bombs attached to them. The water bombs, literally bombs that you can use underwater. And the bomblings, not quite literally a more restricted version of the bomb chews. Skyward Sword didn't actually add anything spectacular to the Legend of Zelda bomb department, but with the one-to-one -one controls that they were so keen on telling everyone about, it allowed you to roll the little suckers along the ground, so you could do a little bit more intricate explodinating. What I'm trying to say here is that the bombs might not be a series exclusive weapon within the Zelda series, but with clever little add-ons it makes it seem like they are. Sorry guys, I can't do a list like this without mentioning at least one mask from Majora's Mask. I mean hey, it's in the title, there's a whole page of the menu screen dedicated to the little guys, so I have to put some sort of mask in there somewhere. Most of them are very situational, so I guess I have to look towards a transformation mask, and for me at least, there was only ever one option. The Goron Mask. Since Ocarina of Time made Gorons out to be these big man-hugging rock guys, I always wanted to be in control of a Goron in some way mainly because how they roll around like they don't give a shit. I'm sure you remember that Goron with the same name as you in Ocarina of Time, and how he just keeps rolling around in a circle. So when Majora's Mask rolled up with a Goron Mask on its plate, and the ability to roll around at high speed, that game shot up my favourite game list like a fucking rocket. Granted it was one of the first games I ever played, but that's not important. The Goron Mask comes after healing the troubled soul of the Goron hero Darmani, and taking a mask as a result of it. You stick it on, and oh boy, this is gonna be fun. Goron Link is considerably stronger, bigger, and with the use of the Goron Roll, a ton faster. Throw in the fact that he's the only form of Link that can carry the powerful powder kegs, and we have a pretty impressive package right here. White Wolf Oles giving you trouble, give them a whack with your Goron Punch and we're all good. Painfully obvious switch in the way? 
Just as well you've got a Goron Pound handy. Can't be bothered to call a Pona. I guess you'll have to use the Goron Rolls and move stupidly quickly instead. Do you want a cherry for the top of this very tasty looking cake? With each different form of Link, the Ocarina is replaced by a different instrument, like how Deku Link gets some pipes and Zora Link picks up a sweet looking guitar. Goron Link, meanwhile, is just chilling out here with his drums. Aw oh, yeah. I'm not sure how many of you out there know this, but other than video games, my other great passion is music. I always admired how some games would combine the two and create a really interesting and enjoyable experience. Zelda games were always some of the best at doing this, and the most obvious examples are the variety of musical instruments. We of course have the Ocarina of Time, the star of that one Legend of Zelda game I can't remember the name of. It's simple, it sounds nice, you can screw around with notes a little bit, and it made the real life ocarina, you know, like the actual instrument, more popular because it was in a Zelda game. How cool is that? Even way back at the start, those zany Japanese people were at it. The whistle recorder thing from the NES Legend of Zelda was pretty random, but the flute from A Link to the Past lets you walk to one of eight locations on the map, a big upgrade on the hat as a nature of the original recorder thing. Or how about Majora's Mask? I've already mentioned this, but a choice of an ocarina, some brass pipes, a collection of drums, and a sweet looking guitar is very inviting. Not a bad choice at all. Though I do wonder how Deku Link plays his pipes without any lips. My point is that the Zelda series technically doesn't need to have any instruments in it to make them good games, but it adds a touch of cultural class to the series. From the whistle in the first Legend of Zelda to the goddess harp in Skyward Sword and everything in between, the musical instruments have been ubiquitous, entertaining and so goddamn fun. Except for the spirit flute in Spirit Tracks. That one sucked apparently. I liked it though. On the face of it, the bow is the definition of nothing special. So what if your series has a bow? So does Tomb Raider, Skyrim, Far Cry, Assassin's Creed, heck, even Team Fortress 2 has a bow. But I'm going to have to refer back to what I said about the bombs. Just because an item is simple on the outset, it doesn't mean that it has to be simple for the entire game. Yes, it's no surprise what you're supposed to use the bow for. You hit things from far away and it acts as a more direct upgrade to the boomerang. Except for the fact that it doesn't come back. Imagine if the arrows came back after you fire them, and you'll understand why that's a bad idea. Admittedly, the bow doesn't really get interesting until Ocarina of Time and the introduction of 3D Zelda games, but trust me, it's worth the wait. I'm sure you know why 3D is more interesting than 2D when it comes to shooting a bow, but Ocarina of Time felt it needed more. The greedy little bastard. In addition to an open plane to shoot the arrows, you're also given fire, ice and light arrows that burn, freeze and obliterate opponents from long range. We see it again in Majora's Mask, but Wind Waker two years later takes the idea and has a party with it. Not only are the arrow upgrades condensed to a single button, but the light arrows are now a one hit kill for about 99% of the enemies in the game. But wait, there's more. Link's Awakening introduced the concept of bomb arrows, combining bombs and you know what? Arrows! And while they're a ton of fun to use, their true potential was never realised. It took 13 years and the release of Twilight Princess for the bomb arrows to return, and holy shit, thank the man that thought of that idea. And maybe if brute force and awesomeness isn't your thing, Twilight Princess also had the Hawkeye, turning the bow into a sniper rifle. So yeah, a ton of games have a bow in some form, but how many of them can be shot with a flaming tip, or a tip made of ice, or with bombs, or on horseback? Actually, there's probably quite a few that can be shot while on a horse, so I'll stop here, okay? With the likes of the bow, the boomerang and the bombs, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the Zelda series have never had an original idea for an item. And while I'd immediately throw you in the face of the spinner, or others like the gust bellows, I can just show you the sheer glory of the hookshot. You are not worthy, any of you. Of all the items I've talked about in this list, this is the one that I wish was real. Something that you could feasibly use in real life. You could use it to latch onto faraway targets like chests, vines or just plain and simple hookshot targets. Like the bow, with later instalments the formula has been refined and modified and even though the early hookshots were loads of fun, the 3D Zelda games took it to an entirely different level. The hookshot from Ocarina of Time was quite simple, to the point that it apparently needed an upgrade in the form of the longshot. 
But the thing that annoys me is how the default hookshot from Majora's Mask, the one with the golden design, has only a slightly shorter range than the long shot. In other words, why couldn't we have just had a longer reaching hookshot from the start? Wind Waker then took the item further, combining it with the iron boots to pull heavy objects down. It also looks much cooler, with the hookshot attached to your arm as opposed to hanging on for dear life. But this is all just a preparation, the warm up for the headline act just around the corner. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you with the double claw shot. Don't let the name change fool you, this is still a hook shot, but now there's two of them. The majority of your Spider-Man fantasies can now be realised because you can zip about latching onto point after point. It's a little bit crazy just how much better Skyward Sword and Twilight Princess made the hook shot by just giving you another one to play with. Now if you die, it's definitely your own fault. Now I'm going to be very honest with you people. Number one isn't anything spectacular, or famous, or really special. It's just an item that gives me more fun than any other in the series. You may enjoy flinging yourself all over the place with your hookshot, or whizzing about on your spinner, but I get the most enjoyment about walking up to enemies and smacking them really hard with a hammer. Let's face it, this thing is a hammer, but with a big difference. Some games like The Adventure of Link again, just treat it like a tool for smashing boulders, but I'm more thinking along the lines of Ocarina of Time and especially Wind Waker. In Ocarina of Time, it's one of the only items and arguably the most effective items for taking on Dark Link in the Water Temple, as well as having a starring role in the fight with Ganon if you haven't got the Begorren Sword. It's also used to smash rusted switches, specific kinds of rocks, and the skull of a big fire dragon. Wind Waker though is just... wow. Take a bow that one guy in the development team that decided that the Skull Hammer should be the most ridiculous weapon in the game. While the Megaton Hammer is a heavy weapon in Ocarina of Time, the Skull Hammer in Wind Waker is THE heaviest weapon. You hit smaller enemies around like fucking golf balls, and the role it has in the fight with the Helmarok King is truly awe-inspiring. This has been Rabbit Luigi, and never forget that every problem can be solved with a hammer. The bigger the problem, the bigger the hammer. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care. I'd like to take his, his face off.